This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 43. Coming up on Space Time. Software glitches delay the first Mars helicopter flight. Growing evidence for new physics beyond the standard model. And understanding the astronomy of the ancients. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has been forced to postpone the first flight of its Mars helicopter Ingenuity because of a software issue. The historic first launch of an aircraft on another planet was slated for last week, but it was scrubbed after pre-flight checks revealed a problem. Mission managers detected the issue during ground tests as the rotocopter's meter-long counter-rotating carbon fibre blades were in the process of being spun up. The rotors need to spin at speeds far higher than helicopters on Earth in order to compensate for the thin Martian atmosphere. During the test, engineers identified a problem with a sequence of commands that would initiate flight. Apparently, Ingenuity's flight computer failed to transition from one mode to another as expected, and that triggered onboard flight safety software protocols to kick in, shutting down the test. Engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, say Ingenuity wasn't damaged during the incident and has now downloaded a full set of telemetry. Technicians have now developed a flight control software update, which will modify the process by which the two flight controllers boot up, thereby allowing the hardware and software to safely transition into configuration for flight. Mission managers say once the new software is uploaded and validated, they'll proceed with a planned brief 30-second up-and-down flight to verify the 1.8-kilogram autonomous drone can actually lift off, hover, and then land in the ultra-thin Martian atmosphere. Mission managers are yet to set a new target date for the flight, but say it could happen this week. If successful, Ingenuity will undertake at least five test flights. The helicopter was flown to the Red Planet, mounted beneath NASA's Mars Perseverance rover, which landed in Jezero Crater on February the 18th. This is Space Time. Still to come, growing evidence of new physics beyond the standard model, and understanding the astronomy of the ancients. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The first results from the Muon G-2 experiment at the U.S. Department of Energy's Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory Fermilab have supported earlier observations that muons aren't behaving the way they're predicted to behave according to the standard model of particle physics. The standard model is science's current best theory of particle physics, describing the known fundamental particles that make up the universe and the forces that they interact with. But scientists have known for a while that it's by no means complete. For example, it doesn't explain a mysterious force called dark energy, nor can it explain mysterious invisible particles called dark matter, which make up more than 75% of all the matter in the universe. It also fails to explain why we live in a universe of matter rather than antimatter, or for that matter, why the universe exists at all, considering that matter and antimatter annihilate each other when they come into contact, and equal amounts of matter and antimatter were created in the Big Bang. So theoretically, the universe should have ignited in a giant ultraviolet flash almost as soon as it formed 13.8 billion years ago. The landmark new result from the Muon G-2 experiment, reported in the journal Nature, strongly supports the idea of new physics beyond the standard model. A muon is an elemental fundamental particle. Put simply, it's a heavier version of an electron, about 200 times more massive than its cousin. Muons occur naturally when cosmic rays from space hit the Earth's atmosphere. They can also be made artificially in particle accelerators like Fermilab. Like their smaller cousin the electron, muons act as if they have tiny internal magnets. Now, in a strong magnetic field, the direction of the muon's magnet processes or wobbles, very much like the axis of a spinning top or gyroscope. 
The strength of the muon's internal magnet determines the rate at which the muon precesses in an external magnetic field and is described as the g-minus factor. And this is a number that can be calculated with a high level of precision. So to measure the strength of the muon, scientists at Fermilab built the most accurate magnet ever developed. It allows them to measure the strength of the magnetic field through which the muons pass with unprecedented precision, down to an incredible accuracy of 15 parts per billion. But as the muons circulate in the muon G-2 magnet, they're also interacting with a quantum foam of subatomic particles constantly popping in and out of existence. Interactions with these short-lived particles affect the value of the G- factor, causing the muons' precession to speed up or slow down very slightly. Now, the standard model of particle physics predicts this so-called anomalous magnetic moment extremely precisely. However, if the quantum foam contains additional forces or particles which aren't accounted for by the standard model, that would affect and change the muon G- factor. And that's important, because this quantity reflects the interactions of the muon with everything else in the universe. See, when we're talking about this quantum foam, what we're really referring to is a quantum wave, a sort of density level, which increases and decreases. And that quantity reflects the interactions of the muon with everything else in the universe. And the problem is, the observations of the muon G-2 collaboration don't match the theorist's calculations for the same quantity when you consider all the known forces and particles in the standard model. And that, therefore, suggests the muon is sensitive to something beyond the standard model. And we're not talking about a once-off fluke here. The muon G-2 collaboration has been analysing the motion of more than 8 billion muons in its first test run. And that's less than 6% of the data which the experiment will eventually collect. Interestingly, these new results strongly support earlier research back in 2001 at the Department of Energy's Brookhaven National Laboratory, which also offered some serious hints that the muon's behaviour was disagreeing with the standard model. Now, combined, the results from Fermilab and Brookhaven show a difference with theory at a significance of 4.2 sigma. That's still a little shy of the five sigma standard deviations that scientists require to claim a discovery, but it's still compelling evidence of new physics being there. Let me put it this way. The chances of these results being nothing more than a statistical fluctuation is about 1 in 40,000. The new results also add to the intriguing findings we reported last week by scientists from the LHCB collaboration at CERN's Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest atom smasher. As we reported last week, the standard model predicts that a type of subatomic particle called a bottom or beauty quark, which are measured by the LHCB experiment, should decay into either muons or electrons in equal amounts. But the CERN results are showing that's not happening, which is further pointing to some new physics beyond the standard model. This is Space Time. Still to come, understanding the astronomy of the ancients. And it's a busy time on the International Space Station, with the arrival of three new Expedition 65 crew members aboard their Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. When it comes to trying to understand the importance of astronomy to the ancients, England's famous 5,000-year-old Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain is an iconic prehistoric monument. And it's an impressive structure. It consists of an outer ring of vertical sarsen standing stones, each around 4 metres high, 2.1 metres wide, and weighing around 25 tonnes. And the sarsens are topped by connecting horizontal lintel stones. Inside is a ring of smaller blue stones, and inside these are freestanding trilithons, two bulkier vertical sarsens joined by a lintel. Stonehenge is widely accepted to be an ancient astronomical calendar, marking the time of sunrise on the summer solstice. But it's just one of many ancient circular standing stone monuments constructed to observe the cycle of celestial events. Science's understanding of the role of the great stone circles in early societies comes through the work of many researchers, such as Dr. Gail Higginbottom, who, while working with the University of Adelaide, was able to statistically prove for the first time 
that the earliest standing stone monuments in Britain were constructed specifically in line with the movement of the sun and moon 5,000 years ago. That research, published in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports, details the use of innovative two- and three-dimensional technology to construct quantitative tests of the patterns of alignments of the standing stones. Higginbottom points out that prior to that research, it was all just supposition. Nobody had ever statistically determined that a single stone circle was really constructed with an astronomical phenomena in mind. Examining two of the oldest great stone circles built in Scotland, Callendish on the Isle of Lewis and Stennis on the Isle of Orkney, both of which predate Stonehenge standing stones by about 500 years, Higginbottom and colleagues found a great concentration of alignments towards the sun and moon at different times of their cycles. And they found that 2,000 years later in Scotland, much simpler monuments were still being built that had at least one of the same astronomical alignments found in the great circles. The stones, however, are not just connected with the sun and moon. The authors discovered complex relationships between the alignment of the stones, the surrounding landscape and horizon, and the movements of the sun and moon across that landscape. Higginbottom says those findings provided the final proof that the ancient Britons connected the earth and the sky with their earlier standing stones, and that this practice continued along the same way for some 2,000 years. Examining sites in detail, the authors found that about half the sites were surrounded by one landscape pattern and the other half by the complete reverse. These chosen surroundings would have influenced the way the sun and moon were seen, especially the timing of their rising and setting at special times, such as when the moon appears at its most northerly position on the horizon, which only happens every 18.6 years. For example, half of the sites the authors looked at had the northern horizon relatively higher and closer than the southern, and the summer solstice was rising out of the highest peaks in the north. While for the other half of the sites, the southern horizon was higher and closer than the northern, with the winter solstice sun rising out from these highest horizons. Higginbottom says this shows that people chose to erect their giant stones very precisely within the landscape and in relation to the astronomy they knew. She says they clearly invested a tremendous amount of effort and work to do so, which says an awful lot about their strong connection with their environment and how important it must have been to have them for their culture and for their culture's survival. Most certainly as far as individual statistical evidence for individual circles as opposed to looking at groups of circles, for example, this is the first time that we've actually been able to confirm that individual circles have a complex array of orientations regarding different parts of the solar and lunar cycles and um, part of the reason for that is that when people were looking at the stone circles previously they used to look at just the orientations that they thought hit on the sun or the moon and they ignored those that didn't so even if they tried to do some kind of assessment on it they weren't approaching it in a very fully sound manner so now we can conclude that we've done that and we've got excellent results where both the Circle of Callanish, which is on the west coast and the Isle of Lewis of Scotland, and Orkney, the stone circle there, Stennis, most certainly say 97.7% sure that they are set up in regards to astronomical phenomena. And how did you do the research? So we had two approaches. The first one was we had to do a very specific statistical test that was developed by my colleague Roger Clay. We're dealing with something that was 5,000 years ago when these things were first set up. So uh, obviously the sky was different then. You had to account for all that. And Absolutely. Also, yeah, and also the landscape, although the hills were there, nevertheless the, the, the landscape may have appeared different in terms of vegetation and that sort of thing. All these environmental factors need to be considered as well. So... What did you basically do? First, of course, we did run programs to ensure that we knew exactly where the sun and the moon were rising and setting um, at the time that these stones have been shown to be um, erected, as uh, scientific dating has shown for them to be erected. And then on top of that, we looked at or examined the possibility of the vegetation cover in the areas. And basically, certainly for Western Scotland, it was shown that there was either very, very open, kind of like a scrubland equivalent and partial, very, very open basically, um, particularly on Western Lewis, very, very open and Western Scotland generally. And on Orkney, during that time, it would have been much the same. So when there were trees, it was very open or 
patch. Sometimes there's open patches in these two particular areas, and we've looked at other areas individually. Is it difficult uh, to put a date on these things? How does one date st- How does one? You can't use carbon dating for stone, I guess. So you're looking at something which is no. buried somewhere near it, I guess. That is carbon, or how did you do it? Well, actually, I didn't do it, but other people. Oh, um, right, so, yeah. for example, a gentleman by the name of Patrick Ashmore uh, did an excavation of Callanish, and they looked at the different the times that specific stones were erected or not mm. and other activities around the stone circle. So they confirmed that the different kinds of dating you do are through a burnt material, so for example wood yep. or bone. And both have been found at Stennis and Carnish. Yeah, that gave scientists a pretty good idea of when these things were erected. I guess the fact that yeah. we're seeing these sorts of stone circles throughout what we now call the British Isles, but also we've seen them in parts of Europe as well. Are we looking at, and I know this isn't your specific area of expertise, but are we looking at something which was a, a fairly, literally a broad church, I guess, something that was practised over a wide area? Certainly standing stone monuments were placed over a wide area, right from Ireland Mm. until Eastern Europe and beyond, in fact, India, China, other places, right through at slightly different times. Standing stone circles, though, are certainly um, not as prevalent as perhaps uh, stone rows or single standing stones. And stone circles are most prevalent in the British Isles, Western Europe, Spain, Mm. Portugal, a few in Scandinavia. No firm, confirmed circles in Germany, but lots of standing stones. The circles tend to be part of a burial monument as opposed to a separate standing stone circle. But there are great patches through the European continent where people chose to continue building their monuments in wood and earth. So there's a very interesting division there between the groups of people who adopted the megalithic culture and those who didn't. We're actually starting to look into that now. Does it go with trade? Uh, Interesting question. I think that in the very, very early days of when, for example, agriculture was first coming in through Europe, I think that that is a possibility. I think it would have been trade, but also the movement of peoples because sometimes people brought this different and the new, this is called the Neolithic, mm. sort of agriculture and the new Stone Age coming through parts of Europe such, such as southeastern Europe and moving through central Europe. And other times it was trade, so it would be a combination. Nothing simple, I'm afraid. Sorry, I'd like to say it was simple, sure. but it's not. Seldom yeah, is, and Particularly, actually, yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Simple answers aren't the answer. <laughs> we like to try and keep it simple, but then, but then uh, reality overtakes us. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's always caveats in, 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 uh, in any sort of uh, research. Absolutely, I agree with you fully there. <laughs> is it just for agricultural purposes, or, or is there more to it than that? I think there are two very important things going on, and I, they're both tightly entwined. And that is, I think that the standing stones are in places that people already knew about, but at these places, and... Uh, I'll explain this because it's something that we haven't really touched on, is that the standing stones in Britain, at least, are in very specific places we've discovered which allow you to view the sun and the moon from very specific perspectives. So, for instance, you can, at half the site, see one perspective, and you know, loosely speaking, mm. and at the other half of the site, another perspective. And so the first perspective is that when you're standing at your stone circle, that you will have the northern horizon very high and quite close to you, relatively. The south will be very distant and low compared to the north. The summer solstice sun will rise out of the highest peak in the northeast out of this range or hillock or mountain, depending on the landscape, and set in the the high mountain in the northwest. If you turn south, the winter solstice sun will rise and set out of little hills, or they could be mountains at a great distance, from the southeast and set into a hill in the southwest. And often it will travel over water to do so. And so you have all these amazing setups that they've done that can only be viewed at these specific locations. And what we discovered, that we discovered that for scores of sites in Western Scotland, which are Bronze Age, about 1500 BC, so that's about 3,500 years ago. And we now know those two great circles we talked about at the beginning have the same setup. And so to get back to your question, therefore, that they know about these places already. So I don't think that they're already agricultural because as soon as they built standing stones, they already knew about those places before agriculture had come. Agriculture was coming into that area 
They were mainly uh, herders. Mm. But they did do some agriculture, but it wasn't as big as it was down south, so to speak. I think that what they've done is actually represent their, play, their cosmological understanding of the universe. And through these standing stones and how they see the sunrise and set out of those very special setups that they've done, they're showing themselves and it represents the cycle that they understand that the universe works as a cycle. And that the cycle themselves work as opposition. So you've got day and night, the sun rising in the north, for example, at the summer solstice, the full moon that can only rise in the south at the summer solstice if it's at its most extreme rising and setting point, which only occurs every 18.6 years. And all these kind of complicated things go on. Enough information, in fact, that they could even, if they wanted to, predict eclipses if they knew about that sort of thing. So there's more to it than just an Neolithic. <laughs> it's a very detailed culture, isn't it? It is very detailed and, and very and very complex, very complex. And it's also linked to the cult of the dead because you will always find the dead associated with standing stones. Oh, that was my next question. Uh, are there burial sites nearby? So I guess you've just answered that. And in very, very different ways. Um, when they're associated directly with the standing stones, they're very frequently cremated dead. And you get parts of people's bodies placed, cremated bones that is, mm. placed in the socket of the standing stone. So they put them in before they, they put the people in or parts of them before they put the standing stone there. And then they may also put a cremated burial inside a jar and bury that next to the standing stone. Or it may in fact be next to what we call a, where they bury the cremation in a uh, stone slab coffin underneath the ground and put a nice stone stone monument over that uh, you know array of a can they, we call it yep. so the dead are associated in many different ways with these standing stones and stonehenge itself is known to have many many dead associated with it with some standing stones i believe there's also evidence of festivals associated with that animal bones things like that yes we've got something very similar also happened at stanet so certainly nearby there may have actually been major festivals occurring whether that's in association with the, the dead or not as well I'm unsure but they've also found bones that are associated with specific seasons mm. in relation to the areas near Stonehenge and they've decided they may well have been the special gathering times that people met together for either trade or you know, other kinds of connections between groups across a large area. That's Dr Gail Higginbottom who carried out that work while she was with the University of Adelaide and this is Space Time. Still to come, three new crew members launched to the International Space Station aboard the Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft, and later in the science report, more details on why the adenovirus viral vector vaccines are being restricted. All that and more still to come on Space Time. It's been a busy time aboard the International Space Station with the arrival of three new Expedition 65 crew members aboard their Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft, temporarily bringing the orbiting outpost total crew complement to 10. That is at least until three of the previous Expedition 64 crew members depart aboard their own Soyuz capsule for the return journey to Earth. The Soyuz MS-18 launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan on a fast rendezvous two-orbit flight docking with the Razvet Nadir module just three hours and 23 minutes later as the space station was flying over northern China. As the countdown here in the Central Asian desert reaches its final minutes, we are compelled to take a look back at the historic symmetry of this flight to the International Space Station with events that transpired here 60 years ago today. On April 9, 1961, Yuri Gagarin was formally and secretly selected to become the first human to fly in space over his backup, cosmonaut German Titov. The final decision was made collectively by the iconic Sergei Koryov, the great designer, and the head of cosmonaut training at that time, Nikolai Kamanin. And 60 years ago today, the final mating of the Vostok K rocket and the Vostok 1 spacecraft took place not far from where we are at this hour setting the stage for its rollout to the launch pad two days later. Today, here at Site 31, a more powerful Soyuz 2.1A booster stands fully fueled to send Bandahai, Novitsky, and Dubrov 
to a city in the sky, the orbital laboratory that is the International Space Station. Launching from Site 31 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. As Bek 1, copy everything is good on board and we are ready for launch. Copy, Kazbek. The crew has closed their visors, just got confirmation the launch key has been inserted. And one of potentially the coolest things in all of space flight, there is an actual physical key that is inserted and used to initiate the final launch countdown. At this point, the first and second stage engines are primed and ready for launch. Telemetry has been confirmed and received from the rocket. Again, that's going to be sending telemetry to ground sites all throughout the ride uphill, which is expected to take just under nine minutes. We're looking for third stage separation, but eight minutes and 49 seconds into flight. Combustion chamber nitrogen purge. You just heard combustion chamber nitrogen purge, so they use nitrogen and inert gas uh, to flow through the combustion chamber and purge any vapors or other remnants uh, before they start the full flow of fuel and oxidizer to the engines. Again, using a refined version of kerosene and liquid oxygen to power all of the stages, all three, first, second, and third stages of the Soyuz rocket. When we launch, the space station will be flying just over northern Uzbekistan, about 335 miles behind the Soyuz spacecraft as it leaves the launch pad. And then by the time it makes the 8-minute, 49-second ride into orbit, the station will have leapfrogged ahead of it, setting it up for that fast track to orbit about three hour and 25 minute rendezvous with the space station. We're waiting the call that the booster's fuel tanks are being pressurized for flight. This will just help optimize uh, the flow of all of the fuel to the rocket engines, helps add a little bit of structural support as well to the rocket. Oxidizing fuel drain and safety valves are closed. Ground sealing of oxidizer nitrogen to the vehicle is terminated. And at this point, terminating some of the propellant feeds to the rocket. There are two umbilical towers really those two ground structures attached to the rocket itself. Uh, that taller one's going to separate at about 35 seconds before launch, and the smaller one about midway up the rocket will separate, and once you see that separate, 15 seconds away from launch. The propellant tank pressurization initiated. So there's that call out. The booster tanks are now being pressurized for flight, again, just helping the, to optimize and facilitate the flow of fuel to those engines in the first and second stage, which will fire simultaneously to begin the initial flight into orbit. Vehicle to internal power, ground propellant seat terminated. And right at 35 seconds, the first umbilical tower separating the vehicle on internal power will have auto sequence start. So the ground propellant feed to the rocket has now completely terminated. Auto sequence initiated. Second umbilical separated 15 seconds from launch. Launch command for ignition. Second umbilical tower separate. And we see booster ignition. Engines at maximum thrust. And liftoff. So use MS-18 on its way to the International Space Station. Ten seconds, the booster parameters are nominal. Everything is good on board. Hearing nominal performance, the first stage delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust from those four first stage boosters and the single core engine. 30 seconds into the flight, the uh, parameters of the booster are nominal. Everything is fine on board. 40 seconds, the vehicle is stable. Everything is good on board. Your and roll are nominal. 70 seconds into the flight, everything is nominal. Uh, we are good on board. At this point, the space station has already flown over the Baikonur Cosmodrome and now making its way in front of the Soyuz spacecraft. This crew is feeling well. Roughly 90 seconds into flight, the Soyuz rocket already moving more than 2,100 miles per hour, already about 10, 10 miles downrange. The flight of parameters of the booster are nominal. And right on time, we see first stage separation, the Koryov cross, those four strap-on boosters separating. Now the single core stage continuing to power the Soyuz spacecraft into flight. Copy. Just before that, the launch escape tower was also jettisoned. Soyuz does maintain escape capability all the way to flight, though, at this stage able to use uh, for a short time uh, small boosters on the shroud itself. And then once the shroud detaches, Will they use boosters on the spacecraft? Uh, so the shroud jettison is confirmed. And so we heard confirmation the launch shroud has jettisoned the Soyuz spacecraft now exposed, continuing under the power of the second stage. 
and 80 seconds into the flight because stabilization is performing nominally and the crew is feeling well, copy. Second stage is going to continue to fire until 4 minutes and 37 seconds into flight. The second stage thrusters are functioning nominally. Everything is good on board. At this point, the vehicle's already accelerated to just about 6,400 miles per hour, about 172 miles downrange from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Pitch, your and roll are nominal. Everything is good on board. The pitch, yaw, and roll calls relating to the, the attitude or which way the vehicle is pointing. Hearing nominal is what we want to continue to hear on the way uphill. Everything continuing to perform normally with the Soyuz spacecraft and the rocket. Second stage separation is confirmed. Good confirmation. Second stage is shut down and separated. Soyuz now being propelled by the single engine of the third stage, providing about 67,000 pounds of thrust. This is going to continue to burn for about four minutes. It's going to shut down at eight minutes and 46 seconds into flight. 380 seconds into the flight. Uh, third stage thrusters are functioning nominally. The crew are feeling well. Copy, Kazbek. 400 seconds into the flight, uh, the vehicle is stable. Now just about two minutes left, a little under two minutes of power on the third stage. Once it shuts down and separates just a few seconds later, the Soyuz spacecraft will be flying free, and a series of pre-programmed commands will execute, deploying a number of the appendages, uh, the antennas, uh, and the solar arrays needed to power the spacecraft on its way to the station. Uh, and a number of antennas will also deploy for communications and tracking, uh, including those that will be responsible for communicating with the station as the Soyuz makes its automated rendezvous and docking. Coming up soon, we'll see third stage shutdown and separation. 490 seconds into the flight, uh, vehicle stabilization is performing nominally and everything is good on board. Uh, orbit insertion is confirmed. Uh, our congratulations. And now uh, Moscow, MCC Moscow, will talk to you. Kazbeki Moscow. A good shutdown and separation of the third stage. Solar array has deployed. Standing by for confirmation that all antennas have deployed. Kazbeki Moscow, how copy? And so we're continuing to get a lot of comms between the Soyuz spacecraft and the Russian Mission Control Center in Koryov, hearing them uh, call Kazbek. That is the, the call sign for the, the Soyuz spacecraft uh, with uh, Commander Oleg Novitsky. Uh, we did hear a, a good confirmation of uh, all solar arrays, both solar arrays and all of the appendages, so all of the antennas did deploy successfully. So we had a nominal flight on the way uphill. We had a good orbital insertion. The initial orbit for the Soyuz spacecraft today is right at around 200 kilometers by 242 kilometers, or about 124 by 150 miles. During Expedition 65, the crew will see the arrival of another SpaceX Crew Dragon 2 capsule carrying four more people for the orbiting outpost. That's currently slated for April the 22nd and will be followed by the departure of the Crew-1 mission, the first long-duration commercial crew flight to the space station, which is slated to return to Earth on April the 28th. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Last week's decision by Australia to restrict the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine to people aged over 50 was in line with similar moves by other countries and follows a growing number of cases around the world, including three now in Australia, of people getting a rare type of blood clot associated with lower platelet counts, including the extremely rare cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. The AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine is an adenovirus viral vector vaccine, which uses a modified and harmless virus, in this case an adenovirus, hence the name, as the delivery system for genetic instructions teaching the human body to produce the same spike proteins which characterize the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19. Your body then produces this harmless spike protein, causing your immune system to react to it and so learn how to fight off the real thing when it comes. Now, a report in the New England Journal of Medicine has examined two of the studies which have led to the decision to restrict the use of the vaccine. The two studies detail cases of people who develop blood clotting problems after receiving AstraZeneca. The first study by Austrian and German researchers assessed 11 cases in Germany 
Nine of the 11 cases were female with an average age of just 36. Of those 11 cases, nine developed blood clots in the brain, three had blood clots in their gastrointestinal system, three had blood clots in their lungs, and four had blood clots elsewhere. The patients all began to develop blood clotting issues between 5 and 16 days after getting the jab. In the second study, Norwegian researchers assessed five cases among healthcare workers aged between 32 and 54, which developed between 7 and 10 days after receiving the jab. The five Norwegian cases occurred among 130,000 people who had received the vaccine, highlighting just how rare the side effect is. Overall, researchers have reported 169 cases of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and 53 cases of splanchenic vein thrombosis, reported among some 34 million people vaccinated in the European Union and the UK since the 4th of April 2021. Meanwhile, Johnson & Johnson's own adenovirus viral vector vaccine has now also been paused by American authorities following six blood clotting incidents. All six were female, aged between 18 and 48. Over 7 million people have been given the Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccine. Now, whether it's AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson, the side effects to look out for are the same. They include headaches, blurred vision, breathing problems, chest pain, swollen legs, abdominal pain, skin bruising, and spots beyond the injection site. 3 million people have now died from the COVID-19 virus, and another 140 million have been infected since the deadly disease first emerged from China and spread around the world. New data from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography has confirmed that global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations have now reached a new record of 417.14 parts per million. The latest measurements from the Mauna Loa Observatory Recording Station in Hawaii show that global levels of carbon dioxide are now 50% above where they were when the Industrial Revolution began. Carbon dioxide concentrations, the main driver of rising temperatures and global climate change, has caused a 1.2 degree Celsius increase in global temperatures. The record levels come despite the slowdown in carbon dioxide emissions in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The UK Met Office says average carbon dioxide concentrations will reach 419.5 parts per million this year. Iran, already designated as the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism by the United States, is continuing its push to develop nuclear weapons with the startup of three new cascades of centrifuges designed to produce enriched uranium. The Islamic Republic activated 30 IR-5, 164 IR-6 and 30 IR-6S centrifuges in its latest breach of its 2015 Vienna Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty agreements which were designed to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons. Under the 2015 deal between Tehran and world powers, Iran is only allowed to use first-generation IR-1 centrifuges for uranium enrichment and to test a limited number of IR-4 and IR-5 devices. The International Atomic Energy Agency is also concerned that Iran's stockpile of enriched uranium is now more than 14 times above the limit it agreed to under the Vienna Treaty. The nuclear watchdog says that as of February the 16th this year, Iran's total enriched uranium stockpile was 2,967.8 kilograms. The limit Tehran agreed to in 2015 was 300 kilos. Iran's also continuing to restrict nuclear inspectors from accessing some suspected nuclear weapon sites. And it's still not explained the presence of nuclear material at one undisclosed site or the location of a missing metal disk of uranium of the type that's used in a thermonuclear weapon. The Orich nation insists its nuclear program is exclusively for peaceful power generation purposes only. Latest estimates suggest Iran now has enough enriched uranium for at least two nuclear weapons. And it's continuing to develop and test its nuclear bomb missile delivery system under the guise of a space program. Tehran's developing its long-range nuclear missiles in collaboration with North Korea, which also developed its nuclear missiles under the cover of being a space program. Paleontologists have discovered fossils of a new species of hadrosaur dinosaur in New Mexico. Named Ornithops incantatus, the new duck-billed dinosaur species roamed the Earth during the late Cretaceous period around 80 million years ago. 
A report in the journal PG claims scientists uncovered a partial skeleton, including part of the skull, including the skull roof and brain case, at a dig site in the Manifi Formation in San Juan County. Former high-ranking New Zealand politician Jamie Lee Ross is behind a company planning to sell a nutritional supplement claiming to protect users from electromagnetic radiation. The supplement, called Presidium, was developed by Italian Marco Ruggiero, who himself has a rather colourful history of promoting pseudoscientific treatments. Ruggiero's other products include a yogurt which he claims can treat a range of conditions including autism and AIDS and a pill which he claims can reverse aging. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says it's all part of a growing industry of pseudoscientific medical treatments which have flourished in New Zealand amid the rise in online misinformation and conspiracy theories. There's a fellow named Jamie Lee Ross who's former national MP in New Zealand. He's sort of behind a company that's selling nutritional supplements, some of which protect you from electromagnetic radiation. He's like a Kiwi version of Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, but nowhere near as successful. I don't think. A less um, successful the version of Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> yeah, the supplement is called Presidium, sort of really pseudoscientific stuff. Taking a pill to protect you from electromagnetic radiation is just silly for a start. It does not work, cannot work. It's just pure pseudoscience, sort of a snake oil. Stuff. Jamie Lee Ross, he hangs around with some interesting people, doesn't he? He does. There's a guy named Michael Kelly who's a naturopath, an entrepreneur, as we've been described. They basically are promoting all these various products, uh, holistic medicine, natural you know, treatments and that, that sort of stuff. And this thing about the, the natural solution to electromagnetic radiation apparently is still to come out on the market, actually, but they're promoting it at this stage to try and sort of work up some interest in it. Basically, this is designed to protect you against 5G. 5G is non-ionizing radiation, and uh, it's not going to jumble your genes up, anything like that. So it really, could kill you if the tower it's, fell on your head, but that, that's... Well, <laughs> yeah, if you get hit by a falling tower, yeah, it's always a danger. And this Marco Ruggio, who's developed these supplements, he's also got some other products which are a bit disturbing, including a probiotic yogurt, which he says can treat a range of conditions, including autism and AIDS. Now, that gets really dangerous. It is dangerous. There's another one he sells that uh, can reverse aging. Oh, and I extend want some your of life to Yeah, but extend your life to unimagined lengths, which is an interesting idea. Yes, so he's sort of uh, suggesting, sort of selling something to protect you from electromagnetic radiation is going to be harmless unless you put yourself in a dangerous position. You, you don't want to hop in front of an X-ray machine. Or stick your finger and, in a power but, socket. It's not going to help. But suggesting that uh, this yoga can treat autism and AIDS is dangerous, obviously. It's sad that these things are always being put forward, and of course they're always sort of labelled as natural products, etc., which is no guarantee that they're not going to hurt you. But as soon as you uh, hear that, as soon as you hear those sort of wild claims, isn't there a little alarm inside your head that goes off saying, danger, danger? Yes. It's like exactly. when you hear that it's quantum. Yes, we get that all the time in the psychic circles. Yeah. Yes, I mean, quantum is a big one in psychic circles. Quantum science, quantum mechanics, quantum energy, all these things pop up all the time in the psychic circles and are used indiscriminately and uh, often, I think, without understanding. But when you hear a lot of these natural remedies and that sort of thing, all of these things being put forward, they range in sort of seriousness from things that will sort of make you younger or reverse aging or give you extra life to unimagined length is just plain silly. Something like protecting you from electro magnetic radiation is unscientific. Something that is uh, a yogurt that you can use to treat autism and AIDS is just dangerous. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with StuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. 
And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 